Thank you very much, Eva. And I'd like to thank FAS for inviting me and Global Challenge as well. I'm really pleased to see that someone's challenging the globe. And I guess I also want to thank Eva for the introduction. I've got some handouts because it's got data so that you can read it rather than my having to bore you by giving it to you. So there's a few there, and it'll be available on the website for those of you who think that figures sing and not like Stephen think that they're just lies. They're both. <laughs> Sometimes they sing in a false key. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so thanks, Kenneth, for making these arrangements so well. Um, I am going to talk about Canada and Sweden, and I'm going to compare the temporary migrant workers programs in Canada and Sweden. First, because I know a lot about Canada. Secondly, because I've been the happy visitor of Remesso that Carl Ulrich directs in Norshipping. And because in 1984, our very conservative Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, said, Canada is the Sweden of North America, and I want to end this. <laughs> what I am suggesting is, sadly, Canada is no longer looking to Sweden, but Sweden may be looking more to Canada. Okay, so that's my controversial hypothesis, and I'm happy to be corrected. Let me just give you some stylized facts about Canada, and then talk a bit about Canada's temporary migrant workers program, and then I'll compare the key elements of the new Swedish temporary migrant workers program that was introduced in 2008. First off, Canada is big, cold, but not as cold as Stockholm. <laughs> okay. We also have a very complex jurisdiction. The federal government controls immigration, but labor rights are done by 10 provinces and 13 territories. So we let them in through the federal government, but we protect them by the provincial and territorial governments. So there's a migrant worker slip between the gaps of jurisdiction to a certain extent. In Canada, our labor market is very regionally diverse. What it's like on the East Coast is completely like what it is in Central Canada, which is completely different than the West Coast. And wages and terms and conditions, because they're provincial, differ radically from place to place. So it's highly fragmented. Our unionization rate is 37% and dropping quickly. And 70% is public sector. So our private sector union density is 17%. And it's virtually no unionization. We're low skilled. And I'm talking about what are formally recognized as skills, not the skills that people actually have, but what receiving states recognize. Low skilled workers work in sectors where there are no unions. Okay. So Canada's immigration system is very well developed and we have been historically a country of permanent migration, but that has changed dramatically since the 1970s. Increasingly, we, we rely on people to come and work in our country, but we don't want them to live there. We don't want to pay their education. We certainly don't want to pay them when they're sick. And we want, don't want to take care of them when they're old. We only want them when they can work, unless they're really highly skilled. And then we have to compete for them against the Swedes and the Australians and the Americans. But everyone wants low-skilled workers, but just while they're healthy and they're cheap and not for the whole time. So we have many streams. If you've got formally high-skilled, you get everything. You get an easy path to permanent residence. 
You get equal treatment. You can change employers. Your spouse and children have open work permits. Lucky you. But if you're low skilled, a seasonal agricultural worker, a live-in caregiver, or someone who comes in what we call the program for people without formal qualifications, you can't choose where you work, you're tied to a specific employer, and there's no route to permanent resident status, and you can't bring your family. Okay? So in Canada, we've seen a huge increase in the number of temporary migrant workers, and they, in, that number is higher than people who are settling permanently. In 2011, there were 300,000 temporary migrant workers in the country. And if we look at the numbers at the low-skilled categories, we're talking about 15,000 a year being admitted under one category of low-skilled, 25,000 a year admitted from Mexico and the Caribbean to be farm workers, and up to 15,000 a year admitted as domestic workers who must live in their employer's home. So that's a lot of people who are coming in and they can only stay for up to four years. The Mexican and Caribbean seasonal migrants can only stay in the country eight months, but they may come back to Canada for 20 years. Okay? So our major source countries for the low skill are China, the Philippines, India, and Mexico. So they're, they don't have mobility rights. And they're racialized. They look different and speak different languages than the Anglo-French founders of the country. Well, we have a very conservative government in power right now, sort of like your government in power here in Sweden. Yeah. And there were a lot of controversies in Canada because there were all of these examples from parliamentary committees, academics, auditor generals, showing that migrant workers were being treated horribly, making good Canada look like bad Canada, and Canadians like to be seen as good. You can always tell a Canadian because we always say, we're not an American. Okay. So we want to be seen as different, good people, more like Swedes. Okay. Our federal government has tried to clean up the immigration program so that employers who have broken the law by treating migrant workers poorly won't get any more. But they can't enforce it. They just have laws that are completely unenforceable. So we've got this huge problem of unpaid wages, migrant workers being paid less than national workers, and brokers who are truly the commodity peddlers, they turn human beings into commodities, charging huge fees from five to 10,000 euros to work as a domestic worker in Canada. Okay? There have been some positive things. Manitoba, a very cold province, which needs migrant workers with a big social democratic heritage, has actually developed legislation that hooks in with the federal immigration that ensures that workers, migrant workers, are protected. And they've dedicated enforcement so it can be done. So that's a real victory. One out of 13 jurisdictions has really cleaned up the problem. Unions, particularly the United Food and Commercial Workers Union in Canada, is organizing migrant agricultural workers throughout the country, spending millions of dollars to do so, and is actually organizing them into unions and has set up 10 agricultural worker support centers throughout the country to help these workers. So that's a real victory. More and more people are upset that Canada's doing badly, but our federal government has no shame 
and just this, at the end of May, announced that it was changing its rules with respect to migrant workers so that employers could now pay migrant workers 15% less than national workers. So they've just said, nothing will shame us. We will do what we want. So that's Canada. What we have is a large secondary labor market of racialized workers without freedom of mobility who do personal service work, fast food, care work, and grow the food. Sweden. Okay. Joined the Uni U European Union in 1995. In 2004 and 2007, of course, a whole bunch of new Baltic, Central European, and Eastern European states joined in. So now there's posted workers from all sorts of really low-wage countries, and the wage differential between high-wage countries, member states in Europe, is bigger than the wage differential between Mexico and the United States. And those posted workers are only entitled to a minimum core of home host state labor rights. So Latvians can come to Sweden, they get some benefits, but they don't get all the benefits. We've also seen in Sweden changes to your unemployment insurance system. So that unions now Sweden has a Ghent system of unemployment. To access unemployment, you have to join a union. And the government changed funding so that unemployment insurance benefits depend upon unemployment in the sector. So if you're in a sector where there's a lot of unemployment, you pay huge dues. Well, guess what? Union membership started dropping, specifically in sectors where there's a lot of unemployment. So in Sweden, union density in restaurant and hospitality is only 35% and it's gonna drop. And guess where migrant workers work? Restaurant and hospitality. In 2008, Sweden changed its temporary migrant worker system to become according to the OECD report issued last year, the most open demand-driven temporary migrant worker program in the OECD. So the least amount of restrictions. So an employer says, I want a migrant worker. The employer doesn't have to do anything other than set out that they're going to pay collective agreement rates or customary rates, send that wage setting to a Swedish trade union, which doesn't have the right to veto, but has an obligation to reply. But if the union doesn't reply, the Swedish Migration Board can accept it anyways. Then the worker is allowed into Sweden, must only work with that employer who sponsored the worker for two years, if loses their job, has three months to get a new job with an employer who's gone through the process or kicked out. And then after the two years, can continue to work in Sweden only in that kind of occupation, but with a new employer, and make an application for permanent residence after four years. Unlike Canada, all migrant workers, even low-skilled, can bring in their spouses, and there's a general equality of treatment. What we saw from the last data, 2011, only 12,000 migrant workers let in through this program in Sweden. About a third IT, information technology, high rollers. Not so high, but higher. 30% restaurant hospitality. 30% agriculture. Guess which are low unionization? Over half of the migrant workers. In Sweden, wages are only insured 
through union membership, not through anything else. There is no inspection system. So we've got a system where migrant workers are coming into the private service sector where are, there are no unions who can actually enforce wage rates and the government agency that actually enforces working conditions has had huge cuts. So employers are urged to be good, but if you're bad, nothing will happen to you. So there is some effort to try and deal with this problem. So there's been some new regulations, particularly for berry pickers and for other low wage sectors where employers have to show that they have three months of salary, where they have to have a subsidiary in Sweden. But these are all before the fact controls. There's nothing for migrant workers other than complain to who if something happens after the fact. So this is my hypothesis. What we're seeing in Sweden, especially as wages become more unequal, is the creation of a secondary labor market in the private personal service sector of migrant workers who don't have full status, who get into job paths where there are no ladders to better jobs and they churn throughout this and 40% of them are hired in small businesses that don't have unions. So my fear is that Sweden is becoming a bit more like a North American labor market and there needs to be more efforts not in opening nasty forms of migration, but in trying to look at models to actually improve the conditions of migrant workers. Thank you very much. <laughs>